What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crafters Live. I'm David Wilson, and we're back again with another weekly live stream where we get together as a community and talk about whatever topic I've come up with for the, for the week. And this week is uh, no exception. Sorry, I can't seem to be speaking correctly today. This is going to be fun. You know, it's um, it's that situation where you have a baby, and you've had the baby for about five months, and for about five months, your sleep has been minimal to non-existent. So, you know, the brain just stops functioning appropriately, and the uh, language center of the brain gets affected quite a lot. So we'll see how well I can communicate with you all during the stream. Uh, let's see. Let's say hello to the folks who have arrived so far. Uh, hello to Eric, Jeff, Glenn, uh, Wei Kadosi, uh, Fikri, Bionic Babblefish, John, Mjolnir, Technomog, uh, Minas Mazar, Miguel, uh, Mark, Dave, nice to see you all. Uh, Mjolnir says, uh, I got a new keyboard this week, Glove 80. I don't know what that is. Is epic, yes, yeah, sounds, well, sounds cool. I don't know what it is. Figure says, Dad Jam instead of Game Jam. I'll be doing both those things this week. Hello to Thokal and to Anton, nice to see you all. Is the bottom of the stream cut off or is it just my uh, YouTube playback window that looks like it's cut off at the bottom? Probably it's just uh, YouTube showing it. Also, if you hear any uh, obnoxious music in the background, I have some um, very nice neighbors who love to just blast music in their car really loud. They have some really impressive speakers, actually, because it's super loud. Arun says, uh, you'll be able to get your sleep back after 18 years or so. Yeah, well, it gets better, you know, after the first year, but then I imagine it gets quite a lot worse when the teen years hit. Jeff says, just your YouTube playback window. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. What else is in the chat here? Mjolnir says, it's an ergonomic keyboard from a smaller company. We'll, we'll have to check that out. Hello to Zerobug. And also, hello to uh, Itaiko. Itaiko. I joined the System Cutters Matrix right now. I use NixOS, but I'm interested in Geeks. Still use Geek Emacs for tons of things, too. Yeah, Geeks is great. Okay. So, uh, let me get into the updates, and I just realized now that I see Jeff's name that I forgot to add one to the list, but we'll get to it. Uh, first of all, I mentioned last week um, that I will be speaking at Libre Planet 2024. Um, they decided that for some reason I should give a keynote, so I'm going to give a keynote on uh, cultivating community at that uh, conference. Um, this week, they announced that registration for the conference is now open. Uh, there's a website you can check out. I feel like... Uh, Let's see, online, yeah, you can you register online, which is free. And in person, I don't know if it in person costs something. In person, enter at no cost as an associate member or opt to pay the regular price. Okay. Non-member rate of $90 for the two days, which is super cheap compared to other con conferences. So if you're interested in going to Libre Planet 2024, which will be in Boston uh, next, next March, uh, definitely check out the registration page and get registered for that. Also, they still have a call for presentations open uh, up until the 25th. So that's middle of next week. So if you're interested in speaking at Libre Planet, uh, which you should if you want to give a talk at a uh, cool conference that's hosted by the Free Software Foundation, uh, submit a session for that and uh, you will be there in good company. Uh, Dave says, see you there. Yeah, I will definitely see you there. So let's see. Let me see what else I wanted to say about that. Um, yes, uh, last thing I want to mention about that is that I'm going to try to have a System Crafters meetup uh, at the conference. You don't have to actually go to the conference to join the meetup, whatever the meetup ends up being. If you're just in the Boston area uh, at the time of the concert conference, <laughs> you should uh, you should join us. So I need to uh, get that uh, squared away, but it's still pretty early. Zach says no actual dates. Yeah, there are dates, actually. Um, if you go to the main conference page... I believe they do say what the dates are. 
I think it's 18th and 19th. Where is it? 18th. I know it's the 18th and 19th because I looked it up. But it, they are obscuring the information on the website for some reason. Oh, well, there's my face. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I don't see it. Anyway. Hello to Emily. Uh, Minas Mazer says, I see you're still dealing with evil mode. Haven't switched to the bright side yet. God mode. I did use God mode for a while. And it was interesting. Um, not bad, I have to say. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'll go back to it. I was, I was trying really hard to use God mode for everything for a while. And then I switched to using Meow a little bit, which was, was also interesting. But then I got tired, like, stumbling around on my keys while I was trying to do actual work that I get paid for. So, I was like, okay, let me just get back to evil mode. And then I forgot to... Uh, switch back to the others. Let's see. Uh, Itaiko and Jeff say that they have a uh, Keychron K8 or K3. I have not heard about those keyboards at all. And uh, Peter says, I just bought a Moonshadow 81. Keyboards. Thomas says, current font. Well, there are two fonts on the screen. One is Iowa Sevka Ale and the other is JetBrains Mono. All right. Uh, next thing is that uh, the Autumn Lisp Jam Gam. Did I just say Game Jam? Jam Gam? I'm telling you, I'm losing it. The, the Autumn Lisp Game Jam starts today. In fact, it already has started. I think it was probably like two or three hours ago that it started. Um, this is a cool event that is uh, organized by uh, Dave Thompson, who is in the, uh, the chat today. Also, Technomancy, if you've spent any time in the, uh, the closure community, you've probably heard that name before. Uh, but this is just a week-long event, or actually it's 10 days, right? Uh, for you to use any Lisp that you want, even Emacs Lisp, Scheme, whatever you want, to make a, a game and then submit it on this website at uh, itch.io. Uh, I will be participating in this. I'm going to be using the Guile Hoot uh, Scheme to WebAssembly tool chain that we talked about last week to try to come up with some game. I think I'm going to try to make like a solitaire game. And... Uh, there are some obvious limitations with using Hoot to do this at this point, but that's okay because I, I want to just see like, you know, what it would be like to write some uh, more code uh, with Hoot right now. Um, I did a little bit of experimentation this week and I pr feel pretty confident that I'll be able to, to make it happen. Uh, I've also got some automation on Codeberg to auto-publish Hoot apps that um, I had some trouble with this week and I didn't get finished with, but I think I'm al almost got it. So uh, we should have like auto-publishing of that game as I work on it, which should be cool. I didn't have that in the last few uh, game jams, so excited this time to be able to do that. Um, what else? And I'm going to be live streaming it on my Flux Harmonic channel uh, almost every day of the jam. There will be some days that I won't be able to do it, but uh, this weekend I'll probably be streaming around like let's say 1 to 3 p.m. or 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, Athens time. Uh, but during the, the weekdays, it'll probably be more like 3 to 5 p.m. Athens time because I want to you know, be able to catch people who are on the um, East Coast U.S. And uh, if, there's a link here that you can go to that will tell you what that time is in your time zone because I'm really bad at calculating time zones. So uh, definitely uh, subscribe to the Flux Harmonic, Flux Harmonic Live channel either on YouTube or Twitch to be notified when I go live on those. I'll also be post, posting about it on uh, Mastodon or on Fediverse whenever I'm about to go live, just so that you know. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Dave says, I have a work in progress FFI in a branch. Well, I am motivated to give that a shot. I was going to actually try to write a little bit of it myself because I can kind of see how it would work to do it manually. So uh, if you have something that is uh, register, like I can register actual functions, then that would be cool. But we'll see. I don't know. I, I'm just going to have like a... Uh, sort of a kernel of game logic that I call into from JavaScript. So it, it won't be that hard, I think. I've already got some thoughts on how I would do it with a limited uh, marshalling of data types across the boundary right now. All right. <laughs> Jeff says, more caffeine sometimes help. Jame gam. Yes, uh, I'm drinking caffeine right now and it's not helping. In fact, it might make it worse. All right. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, I'm trying something a little bit different today. Um, the screen that you see me um, showing the presentation from, I'm actually not using a capture device for that right now. I'm actually using this uh, interesting site called uh, video.ninja. 
where it, uh, this is something that uh, Andrew Tropin told me about uh, yesterday. But it basically, it's a place where you can just do like uh, WebRTC streaming between browsers. And I've got that plugged into the OBS. So if, it, if the screen looks a little bit weird sometimes, let me know because I'm kind of trying to test it out to see if it's worth using on a regular basis. But as of right now, it actually seems a little bit crisper than the HDMI video capture that I was using before. So I kind of like it. We'll see how well it, uh, it goes long term. Okay, last thing I want to mention. Uh, Systemcrafters.net news. So uh, Jeff had a V2 pre-release announcement for uh, Crafted Emacs this week. I believe it was this week. Oh, so today apparently it's supposed to be the Crafted Emacs uh, V2 release. So let me actually just put that in here. Where is it? Crafted Emacs V2 has been released. I'll have to let Jeff confirm whether that's actually the case. But judging from the blog post, I assume that means it's true. Uh, yeah, Video Ninja is pretty pretty dope. I th I think it's going to be really useful for a lot of things. Like that kind of crappy quality of the interview stream that we had last week where the video didn't look very good, I think that would be a thing of the past. So let me, let me fix this. Uh, is releasing today. So if you have not tried out Crafted Emacs V2 yet, or maybe if you have tried it out in one of the more pre-release versions, uh, just know that the real official release is today, which is great. I'm very uh, um, impressed with the work that the team has been doing on that uh, uh, under Jeff's leadership recently. Uh, Jeff brought you know a couple other people, Judy and Stefan, into the mix, which has been awesome. There's also been some other people contributing uh, sort of uh, here and there, which I'm, I'm very happy to see. So uh, I'm excited about the future of Crafted Emacs V2 and where we can kind of take it from here that we've, now that we've got the new V2 design in. So maybe we'll do another uh, stream about Crafted Emacs uh, pretty soon just to, sh to sh show off again what the new model is and maybe build a config with it. I know we did that recently, but we'll, we'll try to come up with a new angle on it potentially. All right. So... I think that's it for the updates. Enough of me rambling with my half caffeinated state. So today, what we're going to talk about is the GNU Hyperbole package. Uh, you've probably heard about this package for Emacs more than once on various Emacs forums. It comes up on the Emacs subreddit. Uh, yeah, the the author the author uh, Robert Weiner Weiner. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing the name wrong. Uh, tends to promote it around, which is great because you know if you spend a lot of effort working on a package, you should promote it. Uh, so you've probably heard about it before. There's a lot of people who actually really like using it uh, for, for various reasons. So uh, I've never really looked into it in depth. I've kind of brushed past it on streams a couple of times, maybe tried to set it up a little bit, but I never really got it set up enough to really understand what value it brings to the table. So what we're going to try to do today is really walk through the major features of this package and try them out and see if any of them will be useful for crafting a workflow. Uh, uh, Raman says, uh, Weiner. Thank you, Raman. Nice to see you. And uh, yes, yeah, so you'll have to tell me if I'm pronouncing your name right, too, because, you know, that, that that's just the, the territory of s live streaming. You just have to figure out how to say people's names and say them wrong a bunch of times. Ashraz says, uh, got a small concussion. Oh, goodness. And Ashraz, I have to say, thank you very much for sending along the links from last week's stream. I never got around to actually putting them to the show notes because I haven't actually pushed the updated show notes yet. So thank you so much. Ramin, thank you. So yeah, thanks, Ashraz. I, I'll uh, try to get those integrated. Uh, but also, I'm I'm concerned about your concussion. I hope there wasn't like a bicycle accident or anything of that nature. Okay. So uh, the things we're going to investigate for hyperbole, and maybe I should pull up the the page for this. This package has kind of a reputation for having a lot of stuff in it that doesn't really seem like it fits together, but uh, there's actually some mm, justification for it, I suppose, uh, in the info manual. Basically, he's talking about how, you know, this is all, this package is all about productivity, like imp improving productivity. So a lot of the things kind of go together, not necessarily directly, but they're part, they're sort of pieces you can put together in crafting a more elaborate workflow in Emacs. So, um, we're going to take a look at, let's see if I can find the manual. Okay, web HTML version. We're going to look at this in actual Emacs in a second, but uh, just as we're here. 
Uh, smart keys, buttons, menus, I haven't really looked into much. Uh, high control, which is like a window manager, K outliner, which is kind of like org mode, but it's a bit different. I think it might be interesting in its own right. Uh, high Rolo, which is an information management uh, system, kind of like a Rolodex, but also it could do arbitrary sort of key value pairs from what I understand. I need to uh, check that out. And then window configurations, which I thought was what high control was about, but maybe it's a different thing. So we're gonna take a look at a few different uh, features here, just to try them out and see how far we get. Uh, I have not really used Hyperbole before, other than just like the brief moments that we've tried it on stream in the past. So um, apologies to any of you who were expecting that I already know what I'm talking about. It's just another one of the streams where we're just investigating things and we'll, we'll check it out, see what happens. All right, let me see if I can pull up the info manual here. There it is right there, Hyperbole. So there's a demo mode, which is kind of nice. Uh, Ashra says, someone accidentally hit me with a window frame on the head. They should practice better window management. Sorry. Uh, pro tip, don't stand behind someone when they want to, uh, what does it say? Pivot around a, a construction waste container. Ashra's, you're, you're doing some hardcore work there, buddy. You should be careful. Now they've got this little weird um, emoji button that gets in the way of all the text in the chat. That's really fun. Great job. So the demo, let's check out the demo really quick. You know, the index just told me what the demo was. How do I go back to the index? Anyway. There we go. Okay, uh, control H H D D. Mm-hmm. Control H H D D. Oh, I haven't started it yet. So can I just do this hyperbole demo? Here, let's do it that way. Okay. So let me know if the text is too small and we can uh, adjust it a little bit, but it's probably fine. If you prefer video introductions, yes, yes, we're doing one now. Um, hyperbole will supercharge your GNU Emac experience. If you simply want to know what Hyperbole is, see the file high about. Well, okay, there you go. Kind of a high level overview, that's cool. We don't need to read that. Uh, you should be looking at this file within Emacs and Hyperbole should already be installed. Control H H. Yeah, that's not right, that's hello. To be sure, press Control H H. Maybe I need to run hyperbole mode. Oh, disabled. Okay. Control H K. Control H H. Ah. Okay. Ah, okay. So we got a little menu at the bottom here. I've not seen that before. So uh, Control H H. When you have hyperbole enabled, apparently gives you a little uh, menu at the bottom. Uh, let's see, press Q to quit out of this menu and we can begin, all right. Uh, implicit buttons. So buttons is kind of like a big thing in hyperbole apparently. Um, this is a, you can call it sort of like a hypertext system for Emacs because a lot of the value, at least uh, at the outset, is from these buttons that show up inside of your documents. And the way they show up is whenever you have uh, text matching a certain pattern that a button might be able to connect with. So like something like this, which right now it's not actually showing up. I wonder why this buffer isn't uh, doing it correctly, but there's a lot of text in here that should be showing up as buttons. In fact, let's see, hyperbole. So any mode that needs to be turned on this buffer, I wonder. Let's, let's kill this buffer and run hyperbole demo again. Kind of funny that it doesn't actually seem to highlight these at all, but eh. But maybe they don't highlight them at all. Maybe it's sort of like a thing that you have to know to hit. Uh, so pattern-based buttons are called implicit buttons. They're activated by pressing uh, meta return. That's alt return or shift middle mouse. So let's go over here and hit alt uh, return. Uh, invalid regular expression, interesting. Let's do another one. Okay, so that actually did work. 
I don't know why the regular expression didn't work on this one here. But, um, so the button, I wonder if there's highlighting. Let me check out, oh, so uh, uh, Ramin says the buttons are not highlighted, so they never show up. Interesting. Is there a face? Um, describe face. Hyperbole, no, wow. Interesting. Um, there's kind of a HUI, no. Interesting. What about uh, face? No. Color. Interesting. So it uh, recognizes these buttons using its predefined implicit button types to specify how to recognize each type of button and what action it performs. So like a web link would uh, do a default action, probably um, navigating with the browser, etc. Try pressing uh, meta return on some of the implicit buttons in double quotes below to activate them and see how they behave. Uh, press Control H, Capital A on any button to see exactly what it does. Okay, cool. Control H, Capital A. Yeah, it doesn't like this one. So for some reason, the regex does not uh, work correctly. Let's check this one here. Control H, Capital A. Uh, press of the action key when. <laughs> this is a predicate that it's using. I'm guessing at, like inside the button, calls act, which will execute action in current buffer. The default is a current button. Okay. At point, activate any of an elisp variable, a hyperbole action type, or an elisp function call surrounded by uh, arrow brackets. In an elisp variable, display the message showing its value. So right here, this should be, if I press uh, control, sorry, uh, meta enter, it gives me the value. So it tells me what the variable is and what the value of the variable is. So that's interesting. Uh, and also this one, control H capital A. This tells me that uh, make a valid path name at point display the path entry. So I'm guessing a path can be before this hash, and then this is sort of like a heading in the same file. Uh, if instead is a path style variable name, man path will prompt with completion for one of the paths that will then display that. It also works for delimited and non-delimited remote path names, uh, recursive LS listings. Huh. What does this do? Control H A. Same, same kind of path thing, apparently. So what if, what if I do uh, meta enter? Okay, so it does jump into that file, which is cool. It's kind of a way to just like have a really concise means to um, link to other files. And the thing I should mention about this is this, this works in any buffer. It's not just like a specific type of buffer. This is a help buffer right now. But if I were to do this in a scratch buffer as well, I think it would work. Let me, let me actually try that. If I copy this and go over to scratch, if I paste it in and press... Um, uh, alt enter, then it does the same thing. So I think it's just whenever you use the act button, then it tries to figure out the thing at point. If you don't know about that uh, thing at point, um, it basically tells you what is at the point. If I were to run that thing at point, then, oh, wrong number of arguments. Uh, clearly I don't call this enough. Okay, thing. So probably what string? Word, sentence. Can you do string? Yeah, okay. So I did string and it, it extracted the whole string basically at that uh, point. Anyway, uh, Matto says, uh, hyperbole is great, but somewhat esoteric and is really a suite of related software. High control is incredible. For example, if you're managing Windows with Emacs, um, yeah, I want to check that out. I keep hearing about it. Uh, Matto says it predates org mode. I think the K Outliner has more capabilities in org mode, but lacks a huge community framework behind it. Yeah, I've heard about that as well. Uh, Ramin says it's more efficient to run the pattern matching logic when you press meta return. Trying to highlight every kind of button would take too much time. Agreed. Yes, it makes sense. Uh, Judy says, hey, Judy, it's a uh, predicate telling you if a thing at point is of type thing. Yep, yep, yep. 
Uh, Minas Mazer says, interesting, to be honest, I think I could try and tweak and extend Embark to get the same behavior of hyperbole. Yes, it is kind of similar in that regard. Uh, Embark gives you uh, contextual actions based on things at point. So um, I don't know ex exactly how you extend that, but you could do it for sure. Okay, back to the demo. Now I have to get way back to the beginning. Okay. This is the demo file. I thought I was at the buttons part first. How did we get the implicit buttons? Weird. How do we make it that far down? <laughs> That's crazy. Fast demo. Okay, so there's two files. There's a demo file. I don't know why. It's a full demo tutorial. Cool. Well, maybe we will uh, cruise through that one as well. But fast demo is where we started. All right. Now I don't feel like I'm going completely insane. So we were looking at this one, which is basically a path. Uh, this is another thing where apparently it's like an anchor. I think you can put multiple of these in a file, potentially. Display the file. Rename this button comp, then you can link it to it elsewhere. Oh, okay. So it's like a interfile or is it interfile reference or is it intrafile reference? Anyways, a reference within the same file to a particular name. So here, this is, uh, yeah, I don't know. This it's got some regex issues here. But anyway, I link comp is a link back to a named link, I suppose. Let's check this out. Uh, debug on error. Remote at P, invalid regex. So it's using a regular expression to see if this is a remote path. Is the regex um, incorrect now? I'm not getting line numbers here. Actually, if I hit it, does it not just go straight to the line? No. Sorry, I shouldn't be trying to debug the code right now. I'm just uh, curious. It would be nice if we could just fix it and move on, but uh, I don't think I'm going to find it. There's a lot of uh, closed parentheses in here, so. Yeah, maybe there's a, a non-closed group somewhere. Anyway, let's not get nerd sniped. Back to fast demo. So anyway, that's supposed to, to be a followable link and it's just not working because of the logic that's in there. Uh, ELISP or environment variables, uh, $var shell variables work too. So hyper B or hy hyperbole colon deer, high news. Yeah, this is really gonna be a problem if we can't follow things. Uh, edit any ELISP library in the load path. That's kind of interesting. But how, how often do you just have a string in the file subber.el and you want to like jump to that? It's, it's not even working for me at the moment anyway. Uh, these are also like info manual links. You could have um, something good that goes straight to an info manual page. It's weird that it stopped working entirely. I swear I didn't change anything. Hey, kites. Uh, Matto says the best quote from uh, RWS GNU, who's the author. Um, Embark is the, the right mouse click. Hyper hyperbole is the left mouse click. Uh, yeah, you could do left mouse click with the, with uh, embark also, but uh, yeah, I can see how you'd say that. Okay. Let me see if, okay, so none of them are working anymore, which is interesting. Let me see if I can re reopen this file. Uh, demo. It shouldn't matter. Huh. Oh, is it because I uh, turned on toggle debug on error and it somehow is being swallowed? No. I'm trying to see if there's a, an error message. 
but nothing is happening. Let's uh, turn off hyperbole and turn it back on. Yeah, that's really strange. I don't know why it would do that. I swear I didn't change the code. So, let me think about this for a second. Um, there's extensibility in hyperbole. And, uh, this file was originally written in 1991. That's pretty cool. Custom. Okay. Let's keep moving and talk about what's in here, and then maybe we'll figure out why uh, things are not working at the moment. A uh, key series implicit buttons. A key series is an arbitrary length set of Emacs keystrokes surrounded by braces. Um, basically, it represents a a key binding sequence, and I think if you try to act on it, it should actually emulate that key binding. Uh, it could be pretty useful in cases where you have a more complex um, interactive command sequence that you want to automate and you just have it sort of sitting in a file and you can just run that. But uh, if it was me, I'd probably just write a function instead. But maybe this could be easier in some ways. I mean, it would also probably use your completion system. So you could sort of queue up a completion, I'm guessing, if you wanted to. Yeah, this is really strange that it keeps doing that. Wait, does toggle debug on error not even work anymore? That must be what I did. Like I turned on toggle debug on error and somehow it uh, it broke everything. Let me just restart Emacs. Luckily, I don't have to worry about it breaking my stream anymore. <laughs> Thank God for that. Okay, let's go back to hyperbole mode so I don't have it set by default. And then uh, hyperbole demo. Let's go back down to this section. So suburb.el, I imagine if I press, this, press that now. Oh, meta ret is undefined. Really weird. Oh, how is it? Okay, somehow it had auto enabled itself before I opened the demo file, whatever. Okay, so this opens now. I broke it somehow before, but what can I do? And also, like I said before, it goes to info pages. Um, yep, so it was able to open that up, which is pretty cool. Having links directly to info pages is nice. Uh, and now the example we had before about uh, the key sequences, if I press uh, Alt Enter on that as well, I will right, we'll pull that up. In fact, let me turn on a key cast uh, tab bar mode. There we go. So you can see what I'm doing. Now, um, dear Ed, other window. I'm kind of curious what this one does. Alt enter. So it gives me the .el files under this path. And apparently there's only one. No. I don't know how that was supposed to work, but it didn't work the way it expected. That's okay though. So anyway, if you want to automate key uh, sequences, <laughs> Richard says, hi, I just got here. Could you start over? That's what the little uh, bar at the bottom is for. You could just scroll it all the way back to the beginning. Yeah, just for key sequences. If you're interested in this particular part of the functionality, definitely take a look at that uh, in more depth because it could be cool, I think. But for me, maybe I don't know that I would use it. But I guess if, if you want a really easy way to put that in a file, then um, you can do that. So they were saying that you can do this with variables and functions in Emacs Lisp. We haven't made it very far yet, folks, just because the uh, we had a little bit of a snafu with hyperbole for a second. I want to know what this H path here means. Because HPath doesn't make a lot of sense. I would, you know, is this like e Emacs Lisp something? Like, wouldn't I want that to say something like, you know, HVAR, HFUNK, something like that? Uh, control C, cap, sorry, Control H, capital A. 
I'm trying to see if there's any indication of what H path means. Display where. And Benoit says, when I hear hyperbole, my brain converts it to hyperspace. Yeah, for some reason, it sort of does that to mine too. Missed opportunity. All right. Uh, Linux shell command implicit buttons. The shell command part of the demo requires a shell that is compatible with bash. So you can run shell commands. Yeah, sure. Cool. Let's run this one. Okay, so basically it drops me into a shell, but apparently it didn't actually finish. Wow. Oh, that, that's shell mode. Shell mode probably does not like my prompt. Uh, Matto says, I think you have a problem with your installation of hyperbole because I tried on a fresh Emacs installed and, and it works fine. Uh, which part? <laughs> Judy has a good point. Uh, call it hyperspace and then use meta space to activate it. Yes, I think that's that's the missed opportunity. But you you need to have a hyper button for your keyboard, which most keyboards don't have now. So you have to remap some key on your keyboard to hyper, and then it would be literally hyperspace. Okay. Maybe we could try this with a uh, blank Emacs config. Let's pull up vterm for a sec. So uh, Emacs-Q. Horrifying. Uh, load theme. Uh, Doom Palonite. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's not as bad. Um, toolbar mode. Oh, jeez. Tool-bar-mode. We need Vertico. Hey, hey, Vertico. I need some of my configuration in here, otherwise we're gonna have a hard time. All right, hyperbole mode. Does it turn it on or off? It's taking 20 years. Disabled. How? Anyway, hi, wait, hyperbole demo. Okay. So if I were to go into, uh, I think this is one of the ones that didn't work. If I pressed uh, meta enter, yeah, still gives me that invalid regex. I don't know which one I was having trouble with before, but it definitely is a problem. Ah, oh, boy. Are we doing like, um, yeah, we're doing native comp compilation at the moment. I do not want to be doing that. Well, we, we verified that a blank Emacs does not actually help. So let's kill that before it just eats my whole CPU. Okay. So the shell stuff uh, won't work with my current prompt, but it's kind of nice if you have the ability to just run something in the shell really easily. Uh, Ashra says, I installed hyperbole mode via package install and it enables itself by default during installation. How does a package enable itself by default? Uh, try positioning the cursor at the start of the link text. Well, let's try it. Nope. Doesn't seem to make a difference. On uh, that one. I think, did this one have a problem or did this one open? Okay. No, that one didn't. That one doesn't open either. All right. I'm using a, a Geeks build of Hyperbole. Probably doesn't matter. All right, so we got grep messages, stack traces, man page, apropos, implicit buttons. So if you have a grep result, if you press Alt Enter on that, it's able to pull up right directly on the line, which is pretty cool, actually. Line 454. Oh, that's interesting. Matto says, I use high rollo as my denote. Hmm. That's, uh, I'll have to see how that works because I don't, I can't visualize that. Okay. Yeah. Something maybe is weird with my Emacs build then. 
who knows uh also uh let's see okay that's nice so it actually was able to extract this from this line it found the uh, file path and it tried to activate it <laughs> Ashra says uh, the hyperbole package ends with hyperbole mode one. So as soon as you auto load hyperbole, you will have it, have it enabled. Well, it's weird because I didn't actually do anything to cause the auto load to get kicked off. Ex Whoa, actually, if the way that you auto load the package is by calling hyperbole mode, then it disables itself. I think that's what happened. Let's check that out. Uh, find library hyperbole. Go to the bottom, hyperbole mode one. Fix me, this next expression activates hyperbole for compatibility with prior releases. Loading a file should not change Emacs behavior. Yeah, so it definitely causes some problems for uh, some people like me. Okay, well, it's probably time to do that. I can't use git blame to see how long this message has been here. <laughs> Uh, these are man pages, so if I were to hit Alt-Enter on one of these, then it should... Okay, there's no man page for that. Makes sense. I don't think I have a spell installed, but uh, it tried, which is cool. Okay, action buttons. Uh, if you know your way around Emacs Lisp and you want to quickly turn snippets of Lisp code or Lisp variables into hyperbole buttons, just remove any outer parentheses and surround the remaining code with angle brackets. So apparently angle brackets is all you need. Um, so I think this pulls up a variable value, Alt-Enter. Yeah, so it tells you fill columns 80. That's fine. Uh, alt enter on shell should bring up a shell um, shell mode buffer, basically, because you're basically running MetaX shell at that point. So that's kind of nice. It's, you know, some simple syntax. Uh, Ashra says the info page for hyperbole shows images on my system. Huh. Control H cap R hyperbole. Uh, let's see. I, I imagine I have to go back to top, huh? I know they have like a... Um... Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. I guess I've never seen that before. Find file other windows. So you can actually call functions with parameters. So expand file name, demo, blah, blah. Let me run Alt-Enter on that one. And it does it. Uh, hpath find. That must be a function. hpath. What was that other thing we saw before? There was some hpath thing that I saw. Uh, display where. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So that's why that showed up like that. It's actually a, a variable. Makes sense. So hpath find is a... Ah, okay, so this is like some special syntax effectively for saying finding a file at a path. And I believe it's able to expand these um, path variables. So that's why this one might be more valuable than the previous. Find file other window, you're having to write some code to expand a particular file name in with respect to a directory. Here you can just use the syntax apparently. Display a hyperbole K outline starting from cell 3B10 with three lines per cell clip to two. Okay. Uh, function definition is void, k cell ref to ID. I'm guessing you need to load a hyperbole. No? Hmm. Yeah, so there is different packages for this. Coddle mode. That's probably what needs to be loaded up first. Or something related. This might be the major mode. Yes, major mode. K outliner. That's a group. Okay. Anyway. Uh, that's not loaded yet. Uh, if I were to say KOTL example, it's the same file effectively. So now that I've, I've opened that, now I should be able to press Alt Enter on this. Huh, wrong type argument, string P nil. Excellent. We'll check out K outline in, uh, in a little while. Uh, 
Uh, Matto says there are many talks about hyperbole in Emacs Comp 2022. One of them being about uh, subtle costume with high Rolo called Rolodex. That's cool. Uh, Ramin says uh, move the cursor to the start of the line with uh, meta M, then meta ret. Sometimes you have to position the cursor to the start of link text for it to work. Uh, meta M, meta ret. Yeah, it's, there, there's something weird happening for me. That's okay. Most things are working. That's good enough. So um, it's nice to have uh, little buttons like that inside of a file. So you can imagine having um, notes files or maybe some kind of landing page file that you open Emacs on by default uh, that has some of these buttons in it so that you can go jump to them and uh, execute certain behavior. But you know, for me, I probably would just have key bindings or functions or interactive functions that I can call, interactive commands that I can call. So I don't know, I mean like, I can see how some people would feel like this is really neat, but so far I I don't see a huge use for me, but maybe I just need to look at it more. Uh, Good Vibration says, removing and reinstalling work for me. Yeah, for me, I'm using geeks. <laughs> Benoit says, another famous quote, most stuff works for me, that's good enough. Yeah, that, that's, that's how I live my life. If some things don't work, Whatever, what can you do? It's software after all. Activate this button, Emacs list mode to set the buffer into Emacs list mode. Then an action key press inside each of the implicit button types below will jump to its, oh, list definition, okay. So this turned on Emacs list mode. Apparently now you have um, a bunch of Emacs list function names if I press alt return. It doesn't like something. It would be really nice if it would tell me which line of code is causing this problem. I'm not going to turn on the uh, debug on error again, though. Uh, uh, Ioko says, uh, what language tools are folks using for the Autumn Lisp game jam? Well, I'll be using Scheme via Guile Hoot. The kite says, famous last words, I use geeks. Well, you know, I think uh, if you use geeks long enough, you become kind of like a... Uh, What's the word? Someone who's very adept at dodging problems. Or you just build up a very high tolerance for weird problems in general. Benoit says, I almost use Geeks. You've, you've used Geeks like five times, so you can't say you almost use it. You've used it plenty. The kite says, I say that because I use Geeks. Yes, I know. I know you do. We all have the same uh, suffering here. I'm saying that in jest. I love geeks. I'm not going to use anything else aside from geeks, but you know, there are, there are problems sometimes. Judy says, uh, this jump to definition feature would be nice if it could be used for other modes, maybe backed by C tags or LSP. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So that one didn't work. Unfortunately, uh, I think this was in help mode before. Let's just go back to help mode. There we go. Uh, implicit button types are stored in their own namespace, IB types, colon, colon, IB types, colon, colon. Okay, so you see all the functions for this. Uh, follow a link delimited by a angle bracket to a K outline cell. Okay, so you can kind of see if you have um, marginalia and a completion system like Vertico, you can kind of see the description of all of these IB types. So these are implicit button types, I'm guessing by the naming uh, convention. Um, follow any non FTP URL. Who's going to follow an FTP URL these days? Anyway, you can tell that this was originally written in the nineties. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, action, action button type. Yeah. The action button type is the angle brackets. If it's an E list variable, display a message showing its value. Cool. Where's the registration for these? I wonder. Uh, creating types. If you want to create new types of implicit button and action types, see creating types. Well, that one worked, so we were able to jump here. Yes, I'm joining the game jam for sure. Uh, uh, Kites wonders what to use for it. Chickadee's good. You should go check out actually the um, the page for the game jam. If you look in the community section, uh, Dave has a post here about 
a template for uh, writing games in Chickadee for the game jam. So check that out if you want to use Chickadee. Chickadee is good stuff. Judy says, I know for a fact there are non-zero people using FTP and the number of people who use SFTP is lower than that number. Uh, yeah, Jeff's right. In 1991, uh, FTP was way more common than HTTP for, for downloading files for sure. Okay. So, uh, creating types. I wanted to check this out real quick. To define or redefine a single hyperbole type, you may either move your Emacs point to within the type definition. Uh, yeah, you reeval the code. Okay. Or move your point to the end of the last line. Oh, this is just telling you how to evaluate code. Functions from the H type class. Are we using, uh, oops, E I E I O? Okay, creating action types. Uh, hack types that el contains many examples of working ac uh, action types let's go back to oh it's right here i b define i b colon no it's not in here is it i b oh i b types h i b types all right cool so define up oh, nope i'm thinking scheme defund i b colon it's not in here All right, let me just stop jumping around like a mad person and uh, figure out what they're talking about. Def act. And we've got to taste a little macro here. Where's that coming from? There it is. Define an action type, an unquoted symbol with params described by doc. Okay, well, I don't need to see the whole macro definition. I just need to go look at the macros now. Display variable. Uh-huh, so if I were to do, um, whoops, I can't type here. Let's go to scratch, maybe, scratch. Uh, display. Display variable uh, buffer name. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, that's a function. Fill column. Free reference to variable fill column. Uh, wrong t symbol, symbol P. It returns 80. I don't know why it's giving me a problem here. Chaos Theory says, this man emaxes and isn't afraid of anything. No, I'm not afraid to jump into the code. You got to be uh, getting in there. Maybe quote it. Yeah, it seemed like I didn't have to. Huh? Interesting. Why? I guess because it says var, I guess you have to quote it, right? Because you're, this is not a um, a macro itself, so you have to quote the symbol. Fine, whatever. So uh, symbol value, yeah, of course. You have to have a symbol for that. Cool, whatever. Eval elisp. So if I were to use uh, eval elisp. Uh, message, well, I probably need to quote that too, shouldn't I? Get out of here. Why can't I complete this, <laughs> this line? Is it because it's uh, interaction mode? Jeez. Oh, 
whatever. Okay, so that does work. All right. So what I'm showing you here is that there's a syntax for actions, which is the uh, angle brackets. And anything inside of angle brackets, the first uh, symbol is going to be the name of an action. Um, so, or it could be a name of a variable. F effectively, you're calling a function, I think. So if I were to put uh, fill column there, then it shows me fill column of 80. So display variable. Let's see. There's AC types colon colon display variable. So they don't just create a uh, function called display variable in the global namespace. They they prefix it with something, which is good. Eval elisp, another AC types. So it, it it detects a few different things apparently. So if display variable isn't a normal function, I guess. What about uh, what switch to buffer? How about this? Uh, what other buffers do we have? Fast dash demo. Okay, so it will it will pick up normal function names and also will pick up these special symbols that are defined for actions that have their own little namespace. I keep hearing Phil Collins. What am I saying? That sounds like Phil Collins. I, uh, talking about the, uh, nineties internet speeds. I remember trying to like go to websites that had images on them in, uh, in 1994, 1995, it just took, took forever because I was in small town, Mississippi with, you know, very underpowered, uh, internet. Just the genesis of a file. Uh-huh. Okay. So, <laughs> so let's see, except keyboard macro. Okay, there's all kinds of stuff here. I mean, it's just convenient stuff. You could make your own functions or just call any uh, fill columns, fill Collins. Okay, now I see. Thank you very much, Ramin. That's what we're gonna call it from now on. It's gonna be fill Collins, not fill columns. So you can make your own functions if you wanted to. Hype config. Uh, in fact, let's just uh, clear up the screen a little bit and let's search on def act in this file. What, what, what do we have in here? Let's see. Uh, annotation bibliography, completion. Insert completion at point into the mini buffer or a buffer. Hmm, that's kind of interesting. In fact, let's, uh, let's do this. Uh, def act, I'm gonna use uh, embark to export that list. Morgan says, hi, David, uh, about managing different time zones. There's a nice Emacs built-in function for that. Yeah, I use world clock all the time. In fact, you can see that I have it configured for a few different time zones. So I do use that, but you know, when I announce something, I don't want to have to put 15 different time zones in the information because we're all over the world here. <laughs> we're extending the Phil Collins meme. All right, so I was going to look at what was it? Uh, completion. Let's check that out. I'm going to go here to do the scratch buffer again and, and use completion. Uh, do it. Yeah, it doesn't like that one. Who knows why? Completion. All right. Didn't work. Judy says, I'm still reading defect instead of defect. Yep, that will also happen to you. Insert into optional out buff a description of how to, what? How to subscribe or unsubscribe from a hyperbole mail list by email? That seems a little bit gratuitous. Isn't that for the documentation? Display a buffer file from a line beginning with h but source prefix. What's that? Return hyperbole source buffer or file given at point. Uh huh. Okay. Some of these I don't really understand the value of, but that's just me. 
So exec window command, asynchronously execute an external window based shell command. Okay. Uh, link to various different things, link to mail, link to RFC, because, you know, we all have to deal with the RFCs every day, of course. Link to file, display a given file given by path. There's other ways to do that, though. Different syntaxes for this. Link to elisp doc, bookmark. Okay, so that, that shows us that. That's good enough. Oh, we were in the info. For that creating action types so you use def act which is an alias for ac type create okay action types parameters are used differently yep they have their own interactive uh extension characters okay that could be useful Once you have defined an action type within your present hyperbole environment, you can create new explicit buttons when which use it. There is no explicit button type beyond its action type, so no other work is necessary. Yeah. Call AC type delete to remove an action type from a hyperbole environment. It takes a single parameter, which should be the same type symbol. Okay. All right, so that sounds like uh, everything we need for action types. I kind of understand that better now. Uh, creating implicit button types, this is useful. So this probably needs a pattern. Uh, action button link types, implicit button link types. Second is also limited to link buttons and requires regular expression knowledge. It allows for any string or regular expression button delimiters and link specifications. Programmatic implicit button types. I see. So basically, you can use Emacs Lisp code to check the, the string at point, I suppose. Def AL is an action link, I suppose. And there's a link expression, which I'm guessing is either a regex or an uh, elisp function. Def al pylib python lib path hash s. So I guess the point here is that it's an action that can return a path to be um, navigated to. So the whole point of these action button link types is just to make links to other things. And the syntax looks basically the same as uh, the action buttons we had seen before. And the difference is, I think the previous ones did not actually Yeah, there's no special format for those. I think they just, you, you get a parameter. So maybe you get the uh, string pi colon whatever passed directly into something. Oh, maybe it uses this, the same um, path syntax. Gotcha. All right, so the implicit button link types, this is the regex one. I, I should probably move on to something else because we've, we've already eaten one hour on this, so. So basically, uh, search git log. I'm guessing that this is like the start of a pattern, the end of a pattern, and then the body of a pattern. And then this is a function that it will run whenever the pattern is activated. So def il, the implicit link. Yeah, we're not gonna look at that too closely, but basically if you wanted to, you know, define one of those implicit button types, uh, that's how you would go do that. Uh, there's also the programmatic kind. Let's just take a quick look at what that looks like. Oh, it doesn't even have an example. Yeah, probably just uh, a name of a function to pass in. 
Benoit says, all this should make it to the show notes, right? Yeah. Difficult to copy all that to the show notes. I mean, the stuff that I have in the scratch buffer, probably. But the rest, I don't know. Ashra says, uh... I always thought that hyperbole would transform the text to actual buttons similar to org mode. Me too. When I hear the word button, I think that the, the UI will do something. But like uh, Ramin said before, it's a little bit too costly to recognize button text inside of a document without waiting for it to be activated. So it makes sense. But it, it is a little bit confusing if you expect to see something happen. Okay. So now back to the fast demo. So there's something about global buttons, explicit buttons, manually created and embedded within buffers and explicitly assigned any of the action types that hyperbole includes. They contrast with implicit buttons, which hyperbole generates automatically by recognizing text patterns in buffers. Quickly recognizable. Oh, so it's like a custom name or something. Relatively non-distracting as one scans the text. I see. See demo explicit buttons or the info manual. Okay. The text between the uh, bracket paren delimiters is called the button label. Spacing between words within a button label is irrelevant, so you can use uh, arbitrary spacing. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, button files. This is something I wanted to look into. It's often convenient to create files filled with buttons as a means of navigating distributed information pools or for other purposes. This whole hypertext idea. These files can also serve as useful roadmaps that guide a user through both unfamiliar and highly familiar information spaces. Yada, yada, yada. A personal button file may serve as a user's own roadmap to free, frequently use resources. So control HHBP. Okay, hype B is the name of the file. And where does that go? Okay, there's like a hyper B folder. Cool. So in your home directory dot hyper B, there's a hype B file. So like a new dot file that you have to keep track of. Okay, let me let me check this out. Control H H brings up this menu. B U T file. That's like button file, I guess. So B. And then the next one was where was it? P personal file. Okay, fine. Oh, let's go back to the info page. Uh, explicit buttons. Utilizing explicit buttons. Can you show me how to write one? Creation. Thank you. By dragging. I don't want to be using the sneaking mouse, even though I am kind of using it right now. Link to creation via menus. How do I just like write it in a file or something? Okay. We got to move on from this. Uh, Ramin says, I write often use links into my personal button file, which puts all the buttons into the global button space. You can use control H H G A to call up a menu of the links. Control H H G A. You have not created any global buttons. All right. Well, I need to create one somehow. I don't want to do that. Uh, e but create. Oh, okay, so control H H. Uh, e but press E, C for create button label. I don't know system crafters. Buttons buffer. Uh, I don't know. Action type. Uh huh. Uh, www. URL. Okay. Where did it go? What was the key binding? Control H H G A. Okay, I see the button definition. Okay, well that worked. I don't know where it saved it though. 
uh, button file. Huh. Who knows where I put it? Yeah. It... Oh, HB map. Hmm. Strange. Uh, in the deer where you are. Oh, oh, ho, ho. Oh no. Well, it doesn't look like it. Good vibrations. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I believe that. Check the message buffer. Something about a hyperbole file. Uh, who knows, man? Yeah, it did create a, a hype, an HB map file, but anyway. Let's not linger on that too much. We got other things to look at. So um, let's go back to the fast demo file. Uh, hyperbole subsystems. All right, let's take a look at some other stuff here. So I was going to look at some of these later, but let's just look at them now because, you know, why not? Hyperbole includes a number of subsystems that can raise your productivity when looking at any kind of hierarchical records, including those from org mode or outline, outline mode. Managing these precise locations of windows and frames in one of the most advanced legal outliners available anywhere. All right, we're going to become lawyers today. That's great. Uh, HiRolo is an advanced hierarchical record-oriented retrieval system that uses text files for storing its records. Most often it's used for contact management, but can be quickly adapted to most any other thing. All right, so let's just uh, take a look at the manual page. Hyperbole buttons may be included within Rolo records. Sure. A Rolo file consists of an optional header that starts and ends with a line of equal signs. Um, you must manually add a header to any Rolo file if you wanted to have one. Can you create one for me? It seems like you can have your own um, header he or, mm, fields in the header. There are entries. And it can be hierarchically managed. Okay. Hello to Yogi. Searching for company retrieves all list employees. Searching for manager return returns up all staffer entries. Okay. So how do I create one? You've piqued my interest. Now give me the goods. Whoops. This is what happens when you use the mouse. Okay, so Rolo menu, Rolo submenu of hyperbole menu. Control H H R. I, I like that I don't have to click an actual menu for this. A, name to add to Rolo. I'll add myself. Okay, so it's got nothing except for just this name that was added. All right. Uh, control H H R A uh, Ben J. Try not to dox anybody here. Um. Okay, so it added two to that file. Where is this file being stored? It's being stored in my home directory. Okay, fine. Now, control H, H, R, S. Okay, it, it found my name, fine. Um... So add an entry, displays last matches again, edit an existing entry. So control H H, whoops, control H H R E. Can I get completions? No. Okay. 
find file, um, deletes an entry, mails to an address at point, sorts all high roller levels, that could be useful. Finds all entries containing a string of whole words, I guess if you're using like a tagging approach. Control HH is a weird binding for hyperbole, I agree with that. Yank the first matching high rollo entry at point, okay? You may use the form parent child to look at an entry below a specific parent. So what if I go in that file? So these are like top level headings it seems. So what about uh, crafters? Oops, uh, how can I? There's no indentation. Mm, nope. We got the crafters and the slackers. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm trying to decide who I'm going to add to the slackers list. Who's not here today? ACDW, you're a slacker. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can search. Um, string find, crafters. I mean, you're just searching for a string in a document. So can I click on this line and it will jump me to the file at that point? Ah, this is kind of annoying. I mean, my first impression is like this probably was super useful back in the 90s whenever you know Emacs wasn't so far along. How would I do this now? Uh, I would just have an org file that has things listed hierarchically and I would just go and use control S consult search and then just find it. So I don't know, man. Staffer as a search pattern will find an entry containing staffer at any level in the hierarchy. Maybe there's a reason why this is useful, but at least for now, I'm not really seeing it. Okay. Ashra says, all descriptions of hyperbole feel a bit like starting with molecules and atoms if you actually just want to do some carpentry. Yeah, I don't feel like I'm getting a, a sense for how this is supposed to be uh, used in practice. Like, here's what this thing can do. Sure, okay, then what am I going to do with it? High rollo keys. After a rollo search is performed, the point is left in the rollo match buffer. Okay, so basically you have some key bindings you can press, I suppose, for uh, operating on it. If your high rollo search did not match what you want, use R to start a new regular expression query. query. All right, so let's let's try this again. Um, R S uh, crafters question mark okay i need to have uh evil mode not on probably question mark that's just the normal key buffer all right If you want to search for a specific entry name in the match buffer, use L to interactively locate the text immediately following. Okay, so I, I guess you can navigate through it kind of fast if you use the bindings here, but I mean, I, I still don't personally see the value yet. I, I guess the idea is that it's, it's creating some kind of structure for... Um, for navigating around a document like that, which is fine. But I, I guess I don't have that problem. I mean, org mode does that uh, pretty well for me. Okay, so let's go to the fast demo again. High control. This is something that might be useful. Uh, it includes the fastest, easiest to use Emacs window and frame management system available. High control found under the hyper hyperbole screen menu. Control HHS. So W for Windows control. A. I see. So it's just like a bunch of hotkeys for um, 
for Windows. Let's see, can I... So slash will split window. Okay, it didn't do that. Is it because I'm in normal mode? Oh, okay, so it's a square bracket. What? Uh, hmm. I'm very confused. Probably the key bindings are not jiving with what I have set up. Uh, Ramin says, high control is like a modal window navigation thing. Yes. I, J, K, M. Zoom in and out. Okay, that worked. Okay, now it's working. Sure. Display row of digit column four. I, I type four. Whatever, dude. See you, Minas Mazer. Okay. Control H, H, uh, S, W. Okay, so you can just do arbitrarily, arbitrary splitting if you know the key bindings and you're sort of, you, know, you have the muscle memory to know where it's gonna be placing windows as, as you create them. It could make it pretty fast. There's also uh, saving and loading um, window configurations. So if I press uh, left parenthesis, it says save configuration of all frames. If I use right parenthesis, it will restore. So if I were to go back and just like, you know, close out all those other windows, and then control H, H, uh, S, W, uh, right parenthesis, and confirm, then it pulls back that window configuration. Sure, that's fine. There's plenty of other packages that will do things like that too. Um, where was I? Or was I in the info? Can't remember. Oh, I was just looking at the, the menu. Maximize window, sure. Uh, equal sign should make them equal, yeah. Jeff says, doesn't winter mode do that too? Yeah, winter mode does that. I use winter mode because it, uh, yeah, and, and burly, yes. So I don't know. I mean, that, that's sort of the, the name of the game with Emacs. It's like every year there's like a new package that just does the same thing as other packages. And maybe it does it in a more, what you might say, uh, modern way for the usage patterns of Emacs at the time based on whatever newer features are out with Emacs. So yeah, things gradually just get rewritten over time, which is fine though, because I think that's part of what makes Emacs con continue to feel fresh. You always have a new package to try that might replace one of the other pieces that you have, all of your little Lego blocks of your configuration. So it's kind of a waste in some ways, but also it's not a waste because you know people get value from it. That's why I'm using Vertico now and not um, Ivy or Helm because eventually things just evolve. Benoit says, but then is hyperbole trying to solve questions about the universe and everything? Well, it is it is trying to um, set a whole framework on your Emacs life, that's for sure. So is there anything else to know about uh, high control? Let's see. Oh, control C slash? Oh, okay, well, that's better. Better than what I was doing before. Uh, Wikidosi says, this so far feels like a package for Emacs from an alternate dimension. Interesting, but very confusing. I agree with that. I, I feel like it's kind of alien to the patterns that I use in Emacs. Judy says, I also feel, at least in the package space, it results in cleaner implementations that move from big completion frameworks with custom UI to Vertico. Yeah. I, I think that um, that whole effort to leverage more of what's in Emacs while still providing a better interface on top was the right thing to do instead of just making like a huge thing that sits on top of Emacs. 
All right. So yeah, I mean, control C uh, backslash. Is that right? Backslash? Yeah. Um, pretty good little key binding for this. I've written my own binding for window resizing. So, you know, it's kind of a thing that people do, I guess. Weird key bindings, very powerful, semi-arcane descriptions. Did we just encounter the new user to Emacs experience, but with hyperbole? Yeah, you're right, Ashraz. I think that's sort of, we're sort of living the new user Emacs experience uh, through a different package. Okay, let's check out the uh, control H, H, S, F frame control. So can I create a new frame? Yes, uh, left uh, square bracket. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, so now I have four. Yeah, I can just create a whole bunch. If I press D, it will delete that frame. Sure. If I press O, it switches to the other. I think that that's not doing the right thing. Those is loading compiled function. Oh no. Okay, that doesn't seem to be doing the right thing for me. The O binding. Ah. I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, control H, H, S, F. Grid of windows. Yeah, you're not going to be able to control my windows. That's for sure. Let, let's see what happens. Um, frames, same size. Yes, let's, let's see what you do with that. Okay. Sway is enforcing the sizing, so I don't think you're going to have any luck there. Unless I make it floating, probably. All right, let's see. Let's make both of these floating. Wow, why is it so small? Uh, I got to see the echo area. If I press uh, control H, H, uh, S, F. Was it equal? Uh, yes. Okay, so that did work. Oh, then it jumped back. I don't know why I did that. Anyway, that was funny. You got some screenshots in here, which is kind of cool. If you have a huge screen and you want to put a bunch of buffers on the screen at the same time, that could be pretty, uh, pretty useful. Capital O switches frames, lowercase O switches windows. That could be useful too. It didn't really work for me at that moment, the way I expected it to. Cycle through common adjustments of a frame. So it's kind of like um, golden ratio, maybe. Probably not exactly like that. Cycle through common height adjustments for a frame. So yeah, I mean, if you like to have differently sized floating Emacs frames around, uh, that could work for you. Me, I just have full screen Emacs frames, so it doesn't really help me that much to do frame control. And I almost never have more than one Emacs frame on the same screen. I'll have one on a different workspace, but not on the same screen. So it just doesn't really work with the way that I use Emacs. Okay. Let's go back to the other listing of things. Okay, K Outliner. Let's definitely check, take a look at this because I'm curious to see how this compares to org mode. Uh, Multi-level auto-numbered hierarchies of cells. Each cell has, has two identifiers, a relative auto-number indicating its present position within the outline and a permanent identifier suitable for use within hyperlink references to the cell. Control K, sorry, control H, H, K, E, which is an example file that you can edit. Blah, blah. All right, what, how do I get to it? How do I insert a new heading? Maybe it tells me in this file. Hierarch hierarchically structured files consisting of trees and cells. A cell is an element of the outline which has its own display label. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Full on screen editing. Click to type in a node and you just enter text. Probably evil mode is gonna defeat that. Hello, yes. Okay, so it, <clears> hmm. <throat> Interesting. Um, apparently, if you click inside of the heading number and start typing, it won't let you. But also, it 
set some kind of read-only boundary right at the, at the beginning of the text. <laughs> Seems like a little bug. Uh, standard Emacs editor command is supported by both your keyboard, yada yada. Let's see, can I delete like that? Yeah, it won't let me. Hmm. So yeah, you can't delete uh, whole sections apparently. You can't treat it just like text. I, I mean, I kind of like that about org mode. You could just delete the whole file if you wanted to and, and not have it preventing you from changing the text shape. Structure is automatically maintained. Uh, menu usage is documented. Well, let's see, control H, H, whoa, control H, H, K for K outline. All blanks create, all right, C. Oh, I don't wanna create a file. Too many keys, yeah, that's a lot of key bindings. Uh, format, display in browser. Okay, I guess I could do some basic exporting. Control H, H, K, K is dangerous. Yeah. I'll tell you what else is dangerous. The key binding that I have set up to kill Sway. Right before the stream, I was trying to evaluate a function using uh, Control Alt X, and I pressed Super Shift X instead, which is my key binding to kill Sway. So I, I killed my whole streaming setup right before the stream. <laughs> Good thing I was early today. Whoops. Uh-oh. I'm in Emacs state and now I'm just typing J's everywhere. All right. Can I? Yeah, I can't even delete backwards. Oh, I can. I'm not sure what's happening. I think that it needs to be in uh, a normal Emacs editing state for this thing to work right. Or maybe not. Whatever. Okay, uh, advanced outline processing, auto numbering, uh, augment style is default, control C L to see the full set of label types, uh, legal. Ooh, so it can update all of the uh, heading numbering for you with the control C, control L. Label separators by default. K outliner separates labels from cell containers by two spaces. Control C, meta L. Uh, change separator to space dash. Okay, so you can change that too. Fine. So it basically just keeps the file looking kind of orderly. Cell creation, control J adds a new cell. Okay, that's good. I mean, that's kind of what you want. You need some kind of key binding and control J is like the return binding in Emacs anyway. And it updates all the heading uh, numbering before that. What if I delete these? Whoa. Now, how do I get it to update everything? Uh, control C P adds a cell as a sibling of the current cell. All right. Uh, control U, Control J, or Control C A adds a cell as a child. Control C A. All right, that makes sense. What about this? Control C uh, A, Control C A, Control C A, Control C A. Okay, so you just basically get this uh, alternating uh, letter number numbering scheme. That's fine. Um, let's see, cell and tree deletion, control C, control K kills this current cell and its entire subtree, control C, K kills the contents of a cell from point, control C, K, okay, uh, control C, control K, all right, that makes sense. So you kind of need to be using the key bindings to edit the document so that all the numbering stays up to date. You can then yank the contents into the another cell with control Y. Okay, that's, it needs to be the Emacs binding, control Y. Uh-huh. Okay. Tree demotion and promotion. Trees may be demoted by pressing tab or promoted by pressing meta tab. Okay, so it does work. 
Okay, cool. I, I totally just broke this document. Um, sub levels move with their parents. That's good. Uh, meta one tab behaves specially. Toggle is a function of tab and meta tabs. They insert a tab character. Oh, okay. Control C A. Let's try to get back to where we were in the file. Refills a paragraph within a cell. Uh, okay, let's try that. So meta Q, yeah, it's typical behavior. Cursor movement. In addition to normal Emacs movement commands, you can use a control C comma and dot for the beginning of the cell. Uh, control C, control N. Okay, yeah, just n typical navigation style keys. Movement copying. Cell transposition, cell splitting, hiding and showing. Control C, control H. Okay, control C, control S to show. Control C, control A. That didn't work. Huh. Oh, that's just, just the show, right? How do I hide all? Hide subtree at point excluding root. Control meta H. Okay. File importing. K import file. I guess you can import uh, org files. Text files in a text buffer. Use coddle mode to convert the buffer into a K outline in place. You will lose the old format. Star outline files. Uh, maybe prompted for the star outline buffer or file to import. Okay, so you can import them. Control C, Control V, view spec. Okay. Ah, toggle, turn on blank lines between cells. Okay, so it's like, it's like a code. So B is uh, turn on blank lines. E is show ellipses when content is head, hidden. And N is turn on the default label type. All right. You can do hyperlinks between cells, which makes sense because you have the consistent uh, naming strategy, which is good. Org table editing is supported, so you can just insert uh, org tables. Okay, so that was just a quick little run through of documentation. Uh, my impression is that uh, people are very used to org mode. And, you know, org mode has more of a modern feel, even though it's still been around for a while. I feel like um, this has obvious value if you want to write a file that looks like this, that has a nice, you know, well-organized presentation and has all these headings that are um, outlined in this way. But, uh, you know, you can't really beat the way that you know, org files look, because it's just different. But I guess by default, org files look pretty plain. It's just whenever you start, you know, adding all the font locking, then it makes it look a lot better. So uh, Ramin says, you can kind of start to see how the combination of K-Outline, high rollo and the hyperlink markup language all work together to create a kind of lightweight org-like information system. Yeah, I can see that. Um, so you have the outliner, you have the ability to create buttons to link between things that can go in any of the types of files. It can go into high rollo, it can go into outline files, it can go in any arbitrary buffer in Emacs. So certainly, uh, you can see how these things would work together. They're, they're not so disparate, these features. Even, um, the window management stuff could probably be automated by a button, I would guess. But it does feel a little bit old compared to some of the other Emacs packages that one might choose to use. Which is not a bad thing. It's just, you know, really a matter of whether a person thinks that it's useful for them.
All right, so demonstration of the outliner. That was a good, I will say the examples have been helpful to understand things a bit better. So that example K outliner file and then the demo file that we've been looking at have definitely been helpful. So that's the end of this file. What does the other demo file have in it? Uh, we didn't do smart keys, I don't think. Oh, uh, hyperbole provides two content set context sensitive keys, the action key and the assist key. All right, so maybe this is the ones we've been using so far. Action key is meta return. Uh, assist key is uh, the universal key, control U, then meta return, and then the shift right mouse button. So what does assist do? Action key selects entities, sure. Uh, uh, assist key provides help, such as reporting on a button's attributes or serves a complementary function. Okay, so um, control U meta return. Okay, that one's not going to work because it doesn't like that button syntax. Even that one. Wow. Hey, Edward. So hyperbole menus, uh, you get them added to the menu bar, but I think that that's basically the same thing as this control HH that we've been seeing, which personally I feel is uh, a bit more um, effective. It's kind of like which key, because you just get the um, indication of what the next key binding key does for you. So, hmm. oh, what did I just do? That was uh, control H, H, H. There's a history thing. Does that just go back to my previous window configurations? Is that, is that what's happening? Anyway. What, what have we not seen? Message? What does message do? Oh, mail. Okay. Subscribing to the mailing list, sending a message on the mailing list, etc. Control H, H. Uh, the different button types now that I understand them. Whoops. Control H, H. Judy says, maybe rerun the last command. That's possible. Activate labeled hyperbole button. That's nice. Fake button, my Emacs files. That didn't work either. It can identify the text, but it can't actually uh, do what it needs to do to execute it for some reason. That's pretty funny. Control H, H, D for doc, and then G for glossary. That's a glossary of terms for hyperbole. Okay, so that's nice that you have a glossary to give you the terminology because it is a little bit different than what people are used to. All right, anything interesting here? It doesn't go into much more detail, it seems. I guess that's what the info file's for. Frame commands, windows, grid. Oh, do we have some code here we can use? Ah. Yeah. Oh, this is pretty funny. So something that it didn't really um, make clear before is that this key syntax actually can have parameters in it. So, um, yes, Ramin, I'm using, um, hmm, I'm using evil mode. It, it could be the case, let's see. Yes, it still gets that uh, invalid regex issue. Anyway, what I was trying to say is that 
these sequences can have parameters to interactive functions in them too, it seems. So this seems to say control H, H, S, F, then 0.1, which I'm guessing is a percentage, 0.23 at Q. So apparently you can compose together a few different things uh, with that, which could be pretty cool for automating certain tasks, but you have to go and run that button for it to work. And apparently you can also get rid of all the spaces to make it a lot more concise and uh, basically illegible if a person doesn't know what that means. And you can have inline code as well if you want to, which is cool. I, I personally would still just define a function to do any of this stuff that I wanted to. But that's just me. I guess if you want to have all of your uh, automation inside of text documents that are not actually code, then it makes sense. Okay, they have logical searches. Uh, history command that returns you to previous button locations in reverse order. Okay, interesting. So basically, the last time you encountered a button, uh, it will jump you back to it. That does make sense if you're treating all of your files like hypertext. So if you jump between locations, you do want to be able to go back in, in the past. Selecting the hist command. Um, can you go forward and back or does it just go back? Benoit says, kind of like org code blocks. Maybe. So there's a special integration with org mode, apparently. You can follow internal leaks in org files or external links. Uh, code blocks, it will execute the code block. That's cool. Um, HTML markdown and Emacs outline hash links. So basically, if you have a link to a heading in a in various different kinds of files, it can jump to those. Info paths, path prefixes, remote paths. That could be cool. Will this work if I try to jump to it? Oh, it's trying to like send an email. That's not right. Uh, okay, so because it was in an email address right here, I think it thinks I want to send an email to that address just based on the syntax of where the cursor is. Yeah, that's what it seems like. I think whatever is checking for URL paths is uh, choking. RFC document browsing. Let's try that. Yeah, let's go to the IETF website and pull down RFC 822. ARPA internet text messages. What year was this? 82. I wasn't even born yet. Manifest files and table of contents. Uh, sure. Email addresses, action buttons. Oh, interesting that it even has uh, <laughs> outdated social media uh, username support for your, you know, your Twitters and your Facebooks. I guess Facebook still sort of exists. GitHub references, okay. That's cool. Was it like a link to the... Um... Hmm. Default username to associate with any GitHub commit link. Okay, I see. Probably is going to open up the repo. Yep. And is this like an issue number? Oh, it's a commit hash.
That's cool. I mean, that one has some value, I think. Just have this sort of concise syntax for referring to a commit hash. But it would be nice though, if it could be a little bit smarter and detect that you are in a Git repo and follow the remote. Ah, GitHub remote references. Okay. So it may be slightly configurable, which would be cool. And uh, references to Git uh, files. Then a Git repo displays, displays its commit diff, okay. Uh, often when the Emacs or hyperbole prompts for an argument in the mini buffer, a list of possible argument completions is available. A single action key press uh, inserts it into the mini buffer for your inspection. Second press causes it to be used as an argument value. Okay. Creation via ace window, interesting. This is definitely a lot more um, complete as far as like telling you what kind of things can be done, but it, probably you need to have the, the experience of going through the initial demo first so that you kind of understand what you're looking for. Okay. Global buttons. So that that's okay. Come on now. <laughs> To create a labeled implicit global button that displays a personal to-do file maintained with a K outliner, activate the following key series by pressing meta return <laughs> within the first few characters. Yeah, let's write out this whole sequence of going into the uh, hyperbole key bindings to, what is B? Control H, H, B to button file, P to personal file, Is this, I mean, shouldn't you just have this be in a file and just press return on that instead? Oh, wait, hold on a second. This this inserts a new button. It creates a new button called TD. And then you can jump to your to-dos with this. I just feel like you should just define an Emacs list function that you can go directly or just put the file path in. It seems really... Too elaborate. It's like a Rube Goldberg machine just to open your to-do to list file, which you cer most certainly know where it is. I don't mean that as like a an, an, uh, criticism or an, an insult. I'm just sort of laughing at the uh, amusing example. Bind the global activation command. Oh boy. Yeah, sure. You could embed Emacs Lisp directly in here to have it auto typed into the interactive prompt for eval elisp. But why? I guess the point here is to show you that you can boil things down into uh, more convenient um, ways of invoking stuff. Like, for instance, here, this line count function, they just say def define your line count function and just invoke it this way. All right, so I think we've seen enough. I think there is uh, some interesting value to some of the stuff in here. I feel like the most useful thing should probably be just a smaller package so that someone could take it and integrate it into their workflow so that it's more tractable to understand because there's too many things, in my opinion. There's like this conceptual overload. There's this overload between everything in here. Um, I think the package ecosystem is a better place when you have individual packages that do smaller pieces of functionality, but are easy to connect with other packages. That's sort of like what Vertico, Marginalia, uh, Orderless, all those kind of like completion packages that kind of click together and provide a good experience. Now, obviously everybody basically uses the same ones together, but you don't have to use all of them. You can just 
pull in whichever ones you want. Um, when you have this big package that has so much functionality that obviously does work together, but it's kind of like heavy conceptually, then it's harder to adopt it, I feel like, or harder to, to use it to get the pieces of value you want. I mean, I guess maybe I'm wrong about that. You can just use the button functionality here if this is what you want. You don't have to use all this other stuff, but um, I think it's easier to teach someone to use a simple package than it is to explain all this stuff and then try to like say, but you can just use like this little part. You don't have to use everything, but you're sort of giving them this overload at the same time. So I don't know. That, that's my opinion. Like I said, there's good stuff in here. Like the, I think the button functionality is kind of interesting for um, jumping to things quickly, especially if you were to have like a readme file or a personal notes file that has a lot of buttons that um, can quickly bring you to places that you need to remember. Um, Emacs has bookmarks functionality for that, but bookmarks are more of a global thing. I don't know if you can have bookmarks that are... Mm, uh, specific to a folder structure right? and not f across all Emacs, but it could be useful for that. It, it could be useful if it did have that. Uh, Ramin says, I think hyperbole is not too much larger than org mode. You're right. Org mode is pretty big too, it, it, but it does have the same problem where it does get pretty overwhelming to learn because uh, there's so much stuff that it can do. So yeah, I would put org mode in the same category. However, I do feel that org mode's value somehow seems more obvious from the outset. I can't exactly tell you why, but for some reason, people, when they see org mode for the first time, many people sort of like get obsessed with it. They, they understand what it does. And uh, at least that was my experience. When I, when I first really saw org mode and understood the basics, I kind of knew I wanted to be using it. Maybe for this package, the button thing is not enough of a hook it's cool it's useful i know that probably a lot of people who like hyperbole a lot focus on that feature but i don't know i'm just trying to understand like um how one would pick between the different packages that exist here uh way says uh, org kind of exists isolated though you can use emacs and never really interact with it uh yeah sure same thing with hyperbole, though. Cool. Well, um, let's see. Would I would I actually use this for the the link functionality? I probably would if it worked. Uh, there there's certain things that don't work, and I imagine there's some bug. Maybe it's a, a bug with the newer versions of Emacs. Who knows? Uh, Judy says, for hyperbole, I feel like you'd have to start with the outliner, but the selling point of the buttons, uh, man, this thing is in the way, I can't see. It, the selling point of the buttons is then completely lost to you at first. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. If, if you roll back up to the top level, like, I think you need to keep reminding people what the goal of hyperbole is. The goal is to have hyperlinked information inside of Emacs. So you're sort of building this world inside of your Emacs setup where you have files that are functional in some way that, that can kind of lead you to other places. But um, that's not how I personally use Emacs. I tend to focus on Emacs Lisp. Like I just write functions to do all this stuff. So maybe it's because I'm a programmer that it makes more sense to me to do it that way. I don't know. Uh, Judy says, I feel like I'd have, I'd use a buttons thing alone without the, uh, man, the rest. Having a unified go-to would be nice. Uh, Fade says, hyperbole seems to work against the Emacs way. Yeah, it does. Well, I don't know. What is the Emacs way after all? What would you say is the Emacs way? It's definitely not the Unix way because we've got, like, I would say Emacs is not the kitchen sink. Emacs is like, uh the whole supply chain for the entire restaurant. <laughs> I don't know. What would you say Emacs is? It's too much. But obviously it doesn't get in your way if you don't want to use all that stuff, but it's, it's, it's too much. But what is the Emacs way? Having 15 ways to do the same thing, that is one thing you could say. 
Uh, Fade says, all things are buffers, all state is global. Yeah. I guess the same thing is the case here with hyperbole. Uh, Ramin says, I started using it uh, with the window control thing, and then I realized the uh, meta ret command was pretty useful. Then I moved on to high rollo. I still use org mode over k outline, though. That might change. You know, I'm curious to hear your um, thoughts as you continue to get further into it, because like I, like I said, I, I don't really see it yet. I understand it a lot better now after going through all this. I kind of understand what the point is, uh, but I still don't see huge value for me personally. But uh, that's just me. Like I said, I'm very, you know, Emacs Lisp focused. I have a lot of, um, let's see, a lot of functions that I've written to do certain things, like find.files file. That just gives me like a find file in that whole folder structure. Just, just random stuff like that. Kevin says, do a lot of people use hyperbole? I don't know. I have seen enough people mention it that I feel like there is a kind of a cult following for hyperbole. So uh, yeah, there, there's a community of people who use it for sure. If you go look at the mailing list, there are there is some activity on the mailing list for hyperbole. It's not a whole lot, but you know, there are people who are, who are using it. Should it be pronounced hyperbole? I don't know. Is that how you're supposed to pronounce hyperbole? Words are so subjective. Cool. Well, let's see. Uh, I'll remind you again that I'll be doing the uh, Autumn Lisp Game Jam this week. Starting tomorrow, I'll be streaming on my other channel, Flux Harmonic. Uh, the links to all this stuff is in the show notes. Um, so if you are interested in seeing how one might use Guile Hoot, the scheme to WebAssembly pipeline we talked about, or toolchain we talked about last week, uh, if, if you want to see someone try to write a game with that, then check it out this week. Um, and next week, I don't know what we'll do on the stream yet. If people have thoughts, let, definitely let me know. We might want to get back into Crafty Geek sometime soon. There's some work I want to do on that. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what we come up with for next week. I'm still like trying to figure out what direction I want to take the streams in. I might start doing more interviews, though. I had a lot of fun last week with uh, talking to the, the uh, sprightly folks. Kite says, uh, dude, but I have to write my own. You have to write your own what? Game? Oh, right. I'll distract you by you watching me write mine. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. It could be distracting. I'm not going to be streaming that long. Like, maybe two hours tops each day. Benoit says, from French, it would be hyperbole. Hyper Bowl. <laughs> all right. Anyway, uh, thank you all so much for watching today. I appreciate it. I hope you got something out of this. I certainly did. I learned some things. So uh, hopefully it was useful. Let me know in the chat or let me know in the comments if you have any thoughts about hyperbole or if you plan to use it or if you've used it and you have some more insights on how others might be interested to use it because they might come to see the recording later and uh, seeing your comments there might be useful. And uh, I hope you all have a great weekend. And until next time, happy hacking. We'll see you.